Well, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you at least remotely. Um, and um, thank you also for letting my co So far, this co authors Galit and Katarina listen in. Uh, this is very much a work in progress. We hope, I mean, we'll probably have a lot more people on the, on the next time we, we give this talk. Um, and you'll later get, if you want, my slides here. They have, um, in the few references that I give, uh, clickable uh, URLs. So in case you want to use them, there's also the papers themselves that you can um, look at. But no, there are not, not many yet. Um, so everything I'm presenting today is very much work in progress, but I think it's very suitable to this workshop, and I look very much for, uh, forward to your comments on this. Um, what we try to do is, I mean, the general aim is that we try to do game theory for much more realistic games, larger games, in particular games where we cannot just list the strategic form and give the strategies because they're way too complex. And we try to attack this complexity with machine learning in the sense that we restrict ourselves to much better, I mean, much more reasonable strategies that are actually generated. <coughs> and a starting point, so by the way, feel free to interrupt. I mean, I, I have timed my, my presentation for 30 minutes. And uh, I assume we have another ten minutes for discussion, but we can also use that during the talk. So um, the example that we try to uh, learn all about this, this methodology is uh, a classic game. That, so this is just the overview. Right? If you go into details, a duopoly game, a pricing game with demand inertia. I will first describe this game. It's a classic game. And in fact, also look at human design strategies that have been used in a strategic tournament in an experimental setting for this, um, for this game, so we know it very well. In fact, I was one of the participants at the time. And then I will present this new framework where the main issue, and that's exactly what I hope to, to learn more from you as well, is how we learn a strategy, how we design a learning agent in this base game, as we call it, the duopoly game. Uh, the general uh, framework actually has, says that this will be a learning environment defined by a larger, more, co more, more coarse game that we call the population game that uh, has several equilibria that we compute with equilibrium computation and, and whatever we know about game theory as the learning environment for this, for this base game in order to not have this huge simulation, but um, I, I'll go into details. And the main advantage of we think of this approach will be that we have a modularity here where we can study all sorts of aspects separately. So let me go into the definition of the duopoly. And this is a multi-stage, so this is the definition of the model. It's a multi-stage pricing game where each stage a firm, an agent, a participant has to um, chose a price. A, a burner, a burner. Uh, sorry yes. to interrupt, but uh, it's still on the first slide here in the room. Oh, oh, I see. So there might be a problem with. Do you not see? You see only one slide. We yes. see the title we slide. See the title slide. No, no change in slide. Okay. I wonder what this is. Uh, let me maybe stop and reshare again. Uh, maybe that's it. That's what we have to do. Oh, share. Is this better? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Let me check. Do we see multiple slides now? Yeah. Okay, so this is, okay, thank you. You see now overview, okay? Yes. 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 Oh, I say so everything I said, you didn't see that. I'm sorry about that. So that's what I was <laughs> talking about. So this was just the overview which I described, but this is, so now let's go into the model. Um, okay, so it's a multi-stage pricing game, uh, which we call the base game, where um, the agents choose a price in each time period, in each stage, and it's a very classic game, which is why we chose it, because it's a, it's a well understood game theoretically. In fact, almost 60 years old by Reinhard Selten, who was very fond of this game, and many versions of it, but this is a classic paper, originally in German, um, where he actually defined the concept of the, what we know uh, as something perfect equilibrium to analyze this game. And about 30 years later, 30 years ago, a student of his, Claudia Kesa, ran um, Experiment, experiments on it, both with subjects, but later on also with what they call the strategy method, where people not only played the game, but actually submitted entire strategies for the game. And that's what I will uh, use as the, the starting point of the analysis. So here is the game. Uh, 
I will give its components with a concrete example exactly in the way that the... Uh, um, that, um, um, Recording in progress. Okay, um, uh, that um, um, was used by Kesa in her strategic tournament. So we have what is called a demand potential, a total one of 400, which is split into two numbers, D1 plus D2, which are assigned to the two firms, the two players, each of which has a production cost, and they're uh, different. Do not have a totally symmetric situation, we'll shortly see why, simply because otherwise we would coordinate too easily. Uh, 57 and 71, and each firm chooses in each period a price, and in that period, the amount of units that are sold are simply the difference between the demand potential and the price. And um, then uh, this, these sold units, we assume all are sold, um, depending as a function of the price. So each dollar more sells you one unit less, but gives you one profit more. The profit is simply profit, uh, is price minus cost. So written, and we ignore fixed costs because they are not strategically relevant. So this is a per unit cost. And um, this is a quadratic formula here. You have here minus p p i squared in here, and it has two zeros when the i is p is p i is equal to d i and uh, p i is equal to c i. So clearly, uh, the maximum is achieved when p i is in the middle between them, which is what we call the Ben Myopic uh, price. P i is c i plus d i over two. And here's an, an important example, namely if the demand potential is split such that it shifts. Uh, according to the difference in costs, uh, for it, which is 14, so uh, player 1 has a demand of 2 or 7, and the player 2 has a uh, demand uh, potential 193, some is 400, then the optimal myopic price for both is the same, 132, and the profits are 75 squared and 61 squared, because you sell 75 units at the profit of 75 each, uh, for the low cost player and the same with the low cost player, uh, high cost player at 61. So to give you an idea, 75 squared is 5,625, <coughs> 5, the profit approximately. And now, why do I care? I mean, there is a curve here that's maximized. The game is defined by the interaction that says, this is, this is the inertia model, that the demand potential shifts in the next period according to the difference to the average price. So as follows, if you are essentially, if you're one dollar more uh, expensive than your opponent, you lose one customer um, in the next period. Um, so it goes up for the cheaper uh, producer and uh, for the cheaper price and down for the lower price, the constant phase, the sum stays constant. So why is this important? Because now there's incent an incentive to lower your price to make more money in the next period. Let's look at an example here. So my benchmark, say, is uh, 75, my, my profit. If I lower my price from 132 as the low cost player, here the red one, from 130, actually either player from 132 to uh, 122 by 10 units, your, your loss is 100. So you get instead of 5,600. Uh, so the, now you sell 85 units at a profit of 65. It goes down from 5,600 to 5,500, 100 less. But in the next period, because you get five customers more, um, you sell five more units at a profit of 65, so 5 times 65 is over 300. It's much more than the loss that you incur in the current period. So there is a tendency to lower prices, to stay competitive, but of course, if both um, players do it, the price will not shift. I mean, the demand potential will not shift, so it's a kind of prisoner's dilemma situation. They both lose out. And the question is, uh, how should this be played? And there is an obvious way of doing this cooperatively by simply choosing this monopoly price, duopoly, monopoly price, yeah, the myopic price, and then it very quickly converges to, I mean, the split that I just showed you. Okay, so it's two or seven for the high cost, uh, for the high, uh, the more efficient producer, one or one ninth key for the low cost, uh, for the high cost producer, they get profits over these 25 periods of one key. Okay. There's also a small disk I forget, and which is actually not strategically very important, and people tend to ignore it. Now, this is not the way the game is analyzed traditionally. That is not as by Zen, which is much, much more fit. We actually lower prices. You can do this by backward deduction. You can parameterize it with your demand potential. And so when you see it, when you go backwards, you get um, fairly quickly very constant prices, which are much, much lower, at about 95 or so. Very much in favor for the low-cost firm, which makes a lot of profit, 137. Actually, not much, that much less than compared to the monopoly, but 
um, the high cost firm loses out massively. There's also an end effect when you're near the end of the game because then you go more towards the myopic thing and then you cash in, so to speak, uh, with an entire higher cost. So that's the subtly imperfect equilibrium. Um, Zelten also analyzed it with a discount factor when the game runs infinite, in, in infinity, not long. Um, but this is the basis, the, the constant number of periods, 25. Now the question was to Zelten in particular, who I mean is very was becoming very interested in experiment, but whether people actually would play like that, like that. And for that purpose, I mean Claudia Kesa ran these strategy experiments. It turned out that the subjects playing these games did not understand the game easily. It's a complicated game. So instead, she asked for submitting strategies, which are essentially four flowcharts, still compact description, one for the low cost and one for the high cost firm. She uh, solicited, in fact, 45 cases, so but I was one of them. Uh, then gave some feedback of how they performed. The second round had still 34 entries, and here are some, some of the ways of how they played against each other. They were aggressive strategies like this thing. You might see it. I mean, they might hurt this. <coughs> then this is where um, the Sarkin Perfect equilibrium plays. This is even more aggressive, and then you have here weekly cooperative or strongly cooperative strategies whose payoffs are along the operating frontier, typically in favor of the, the low-cost firm. But anyhow, that's what we had. And as, as I said, I participated here, and I actually did very well. I, I came on top in the second round, and um, by being evaluated against all the other teams, including your own type that are there, and what was very important when we played this game was that you needed to understand it well, the mechanics, how this worked, like shading your price with the quadratic function and so on, focusing on the demand, what demand potential rather than the price or the profit. I mean, that was very important. Looking at smaller prices, which strongly increase future profits, um, and also be some sort of stability in how you play rather than oscillating to avoid wild swings. Just maybe you can imagine that if you try to claim back customers by going down 20 and then going back to zero relative to the market price, it would mean a loss of 400, then zero, 400, loss and zero. I mean, 400, zero, 400, zero is worse than going down by 10 all the time, which has the same effect, which would be a loss of 100, 100, 100 in each period relative to the, uh, the big profit that you make um, by having uh, lots of customers, say 50, 600 as the profit. It was also employed, uh, export, important to exploit people who didn't understand the game, suckers, if you wish, I mean, to make a lot of money. There was no clear cooperative behavior because the game is not symmetric. There is clearly a focal point there, um, which would be the market play, but that's not well defined. People could see that differently. I mean, it's not clear that uh, 207 and 1093 is the natural split of the demand potential. Um, and also, what was very much observed is that the strategies do react, so typically to the last price of the opponent, for example, even copying that as a kind of tit for tat strategy. But they typically have no model of the opponent. Our team, um, <coughs> I mean, my strategy was the, one of the very few who did have a very minor predicted behavior of the other player, which avoided these <laughs> wild swings. But even that was not, not trying to understand, but just I mean, adjusting to some prediction in order to be uh, a little better in control. And for myself, when I tried to design this strategy, I also had the problem of, I, mean, I didn't know anything about the other players. I mean, so I played against myself and developed some simple strategies. Right now, I re-implemented some of these strategies and already learning something of how you could, how you could play. And what I want to do is, of course, I mean, have, instead of myself designing the strategy, have a learning agent doing that. So we now go into the learning framework. So to repeat, we have this bay base game, which is here the pricing game over 25 rounds in these two roles of low or high cost firm. Actually, we're already thinking that it might be better uh, to not try to look at this end effect. We want, uh, first of all, this is not natural in a setting. We don't want to, uh, any, any agent to learn that there is an end effect and raise the prices towards the end of these rounds. Rather make the game infinite uh, of course, not infinite, you have to terminate. And, and the way we do it is by having a termination probability of, say, 4%. It, after each round, so the, the game is over with a probability of 4%, which gives an, uh, us an average run of 25 rounds. Of course, that's random. That could be shorter or longer, but it will clearly not be infinite. The probability of running for a long time goes exponentially down. So that would mean the game is essentially stationary at each point, but with an implicit 
discount factor given by this, by this dimension problem. Our strategy, or the agent, we think we should take a neural network, and uh, we, we, we're going to get there, we, have, we are not there, that chooses the next price as a function of something, of the data for the last, say, three periods, maybe five periods, we, we will, I mean, I observe that we don't look very much into the, into the past, so maybe the last three periods are already enough, maybe we take more of them. And then we, the idea is that we train this agent by repeatedly meeting another random agent. And this random agent is drawn from a mixed equilibrium, according to the mixed equilibrium distribution, of existing agents, of existing strategies, which what we call the population game. And then so we have pairwise interactions. That's the model. And it's very much in line what you do in, in models of evolutionary game, game theory, where you have a matrix. You meet a random opponent, and then you try to look at your fitness in that context. Um, and then after we successfully train, we have to decide what that means. A strategy uh, we added to this population game. And by when we trained it, we actually I mean, collect payoffs. <coughs> we we uh, I mean, collect statistics about how well this agent does against each opponent, which means um, we have a payoff pair for each opponent, and that we enter into a bimatrix game as a new row or column. And then we compute a new equilibrium. And that new equilibrium will then be the next learning environment. So in that way, we try to decouple the problem of learning an agent with the whole scenario, because we want to keep a relatively uh, stable learning scenario, learning environment, which is actually such a mixed equilibrium. And here, this is the main slide where we are totally, I mean, uh, everything is new and not yet implemented. And later on, I hope, or right now, maybe even, but I mean, maybe we can discuss something where we could resolve these issues that we have here. So to repeat, the main assumption is that the learning environment is constant. So it's not evolving with the learning agent yet. But it's, it's, not, it's random in the sense that it's a mixed equilibrium. So um, typically, we will meet I mean, a random opponent and also running, a random running time of this interaction. And one of the first problems is, of course, that we don't just look at a single path of play, but we want to design a strategy. We want to know how to react to an unknown situation in the sense that there is some price of the opponent that we haven't seen yet. And so we have to learn a whole strategy. And by the way, for that reason, I think a neural network is good because there's some continuity here, because there will be a function of the price, not just the state of what the other uh, discrete state. So let's say that we learn this price as a function of the last periods, so where we use the following information. The minimal thing should be my own price. Well, in the sense I remember it, I chose it, and the on profit, and also the opponent price. Um, but in a sense, um, that is already implicit because the on profit, I mean, actually in the next period, uh, the on profit will go down uh, when the opponent has lowered their price. But we know this information, the opponent price. And maybe the demand potential, which is very important, could be recorded either implicitly or explicitly. I mean, that would be an extra state variable. But it's very informative. So in a sense, we're already making decisions here how we design this learning agent. We can try both. I mean, maybe this minimal thing, price and profit, is maybe opponent price and demand potential. We have to see. I mean, we, we are not there yet. And the second question, which I'm also not very sure about at all, is the reward function should clearly be the average per period profit at the end of the game, when the game is over. Why average? Because if it's total profit, it's very random depending on the when the when the game has been killed by the random termination. The average profit is more and more more uh, appropriate. But I, I mean, we cannot do it while we play, or not at least not immediately, because when you do it immediately, it's only the short time profit which is not affected by the opponent action yet. I mean, the interaction comes in when the, when the demand shifts. So it's, it's a tricky question of how to design this reward function, and, and we have to see. Um, for the population game, I said that we need to design, I mean, to enter a, a new, this is a higher level, where I don't have a whole strategy, I just have a payoff pair. And I would record the profit during this place, and I train the agent, and um, we update it for each opponent separately, I think we should weigh with the length of the interaction, because if that's very short, it could be only three periods, it should have less weight than if it's longer. I also don't know how to initialize the agent randomly, maybe vary an existing agent. 
And we also have to decide when an agent has learned enough. I mean, is it when the, when the population gain payoffs seem high enough to say this is a very good agent? What shall we do here? I mean, we should need the minimum number of interactions to at least match each opponent agent that we are playing against, for example. So that's, these are the main issues that we have to resolve. When I designed this game, we could see it from a different point. I mean, we could say we, we want to design, I mean, a strong strategy in this game, like I did when I participated, which, as I just learned, is called feature engineering. I don't think it's as interesting because it's not general. But I used a few parameters myself in the strategy that I used. For example, I had an aim for a fair split of the demand potential. That could be something that one could adjust. I, I had a sh I mean, actually, I was predicting the opponent price with something which was not just the past price, but the weighted function of the easy history, just exponentially weighted, like what I had before with some alpha, say a half, of what I observed. In fact, it turned out that uh, pre predicting the sales of the opponent is the difference between the demand potential and price, which is much more stable, a much better predictor. Maybe you can use... Anyhow, you can play with all these things. We have a custom-made agent. Um, uh, maybe as a benchmark, just in this game. And also how much I shade against, uh, because it's very costless to shade the price, I mean, downwards, when you want to um, get more customers. So let's look at the population game. Um, so remember that this is added to the population game as a row or column, depending on whether it's a low or high cost firm. Another question should be at both the row and column, or one at a time. And then we compute a new equilibrium, which is typically mixed and not unique. Already, when I had a few handmade strategies, I had a 5x5 five five game, I mean, no, 10x10 ten ten game, but I had five equilibria. They were not unique. There was one pure equilibrium, which was my own strategy, but it was not that significantly better than the other ones. So that equilibrium, mixed equilibrium defines the next learning equilibrium uh, environment, as I said. And then, of course, there's the question, which equilibrium? And in fact, no, this is a game theory question that every game theorist faces, unless they have a zero-sum game here. And so we could, and that's what I'm thinking of, uh, select the equilibrium via um, um, a starting profile of mixed strategies, which defines the so-called prior. We have an algorithm there, which is a tracing procedure, which means that you play um, a path of equilibria that's a mixture against what you actually play in this prior, and when the, once the prior has prob reached probability zero, I and mean, you have an equilibrium. And in fact, it's probably a good proxy for evolutionary dynamics. It means we could also run evolutionary dynamics, but then we have to decide over what it converges to, and it might not converge. Anyhow, we have an equilibrium selection method here. The prior selection is also finding a positively indexed equilibrium. I'll say this on the next slide what that means, which is very good for dynamic stability. And we could, of course, use the previous equilibrium as the prior, which would mean then we have history-dependent evolution of the population game. Again, these are all things we could test separately. By the way, the equilibrium that we tend to find have typically small support, so they don't mix more than a, a few strategies, even if the game is larger, which is good, because, first of all, we have a small learning environment, not a huge one. We have only a few opponents that have some decent probabilities. And I personally don't think we have any issue here with equilibrium computation in the sense of PPEV hardness. I mean, the population game is relatively small. I mean, this is our experience. From equilibrium computation, we feel very comfortable, much more so than the learning uh, question. Just to uh, uh, show what the fixed point is, about the index is, in general, if we have a fixed, I mean, a fixed point of a function on a set to itself. Here's a very simple example where I have the unit interval and a continuous function, which I can draw like this, it crosses the identity line at least once, in fact, an odd number of times generically, and in which direction you cross the index, which is formally defined as the sign of the derivative when you take the identity minus the function, because the zeros of these things are the fixed points, and then when it goes upwards, which is here and here, um, that's positive, and when you go downwards, remember here, f is minus f of x here is negative, and this is important, which for dynamic stability, because let's imagine you just iterate this fixed point. Let's say we start here with the cursor. I mean, so we evaluate the function here. We take this as the next um, input to the function, which means we go on to this blue line. We evaluate it again. And then this will converge, hopefully. But it can only converge, I mean, down here as well, 
if the index is positive, you see when we start near the negative index, it's just too steep. It, it cannot work. I mean, it will, it will diverge. So an example of a negatively indexed uh, equilibrium is in the battle of the sexes, the mixed equilibrium. The pure equilibrium have index plus one. Uh, the mixed equilibrium has index minus one. It's not stable. And we don't want these equilibria. So here's an example of a mixed equilibrium, which actually resulted from this play by humans. Um, my column A was, the, my strategy was column A, which I did very, very well. These are the blue payoffs to the high cost layer, low cost layer L. And what I found then, I'm going up to the next point here, which is my final point to some extent. Um, when we compute the mixed equilibrium probabilities, and they correspond also to what happened in an evolutionary setting, they're actually relatively low. My brilliant strategy had only 5% of the total. And here's an explanation. You look at what you do when you train your agent, but what determines these probabilities is actually very much determined, that's a game theoretic feature, by what you do to your opponents. And here is one very aggressive entrance, B, for example, did very well against the other results. He was um, beaten thoroughly by us, and because he got much, much less um, than everybody else, means that we cannot have too much weight in order to have an equilibrium, because everybody has to have equal payoffs. So to be more precise, so what I'm after is maybe if we are after these probabilities in the, in the evolutionary game, that's a different goal. Let's market share, if you wish. In a mixed equilibrium, all pure best responses have equal payoffs. We know that. That's the main criteria of defining mixed equilibrium. But the probabilities themselves, you are indifferent between your best responses, depend on opponent's payoffs. So here's an inspection game, which is a nice example. You can inspect or not, uh, not inspect or not inspect as an inspector. There is an inspectee who can comply or cheat. Compliance is a, a benchmark. Cheating means 10 for the cheater, minus 10 for the inspector. Complying the inspection has a low cost, but still a cost. And uh, catching a cheater has a big penalty for the cheater, still a hassle for the inspector. So we have no pure strategy here. Clearly, there is a mixed equilibrium. In this, with these numbers, it's 20% cheating. And now the interesting thing is if you increase the penalty, say from 40 to 90, the cheating probability doesn't change. <coughs> interesting enough, what does change is the equilibrium inspection probability, because you can now inspect with much lower probability, because that will be enough to deter and to induce compliance to a certain extent. Not induce, in fact, it's a mixed equilibrium, unless you have a sucker back there and so on. Anyhow. So I observed this one time when I connected, helped my son move. I was all of a sudden there with a new sign confirmed on his property. It said private land, parking control management limited, parking charge 100 pounds. And I thought, oh, bad. And then I realized this, and I realized, oh, I think this means they're not going to come inspect you. <laughs> and I felt quite safe. I mean, this actually 100 pounds was comfort. It's much higher than what you would get paid by the, uh, charged by the city. So I felt very safe. In fact, I wasn't expected, so that was good. So, but if we do that, what I'm saying is, um, maybe, I mean, we should learn how to treat opponents equally to get a high population share, if that is our new goal. It's, it's another aspect of this, of this trend. Maybe a late one. So, let me try to sell the same work, this, this, this framework, with the following advantages, what I think they are. Um, it is modular rather than a huge simulation. I hope we avoid this problem that when we have learning agents that this whole thing will diverge because we have two aspects here. We have this base game, the pricing game, which is already, I mean, it's not a big game. It might be already complex, maybe too complex because, you know, it's not even a repeated game. It's more like a stochastic game. The state, which is the demand potential, is very important. It's not just the same situation over and over. It is what I found very interesting. It has both competitive and cooperative aspects, and therefore multiple equilibria. And we have to deal with that problem, which is common. We also have potentially handmade good strategies, which you can use as benchmarks. And what we hope, of course, that we could replace it by another game using the same framework. And then we have, and then we have at the higher level, the course of population game, where we use all these games here, the insights like First of all, to provide an equilibrium, and it's equilibrium as a stable learning environment. Um, with its, as I said, non-unique equilibria, we can apply different equilibrium concepts, such as evolutionary strategies, mixed equilibria, and we can hopefully <coughs> play with all these things and, and, and independently, like what happens when we twist these things rather than having this, this monolithic thing. And the challenges that we see um, are as follows. I think we are under control. 
the, all the equilibrium computation. In fact, it's already partly implemented, setting this tournament. What we don't have yet is the learning agents, quite clearly. That's just starting. And of course, I mean, there's a lot of literature. There's a, a paper, the collusion paper, um, um, which is, um, you might know, Calvano, Calzolari, Benepolo, Pallastorello. Um, collusion, which has a similar game, a simpler game, a different learning thing. I can talk about it if you have questions. We think we can also extend it to more than two firms, which would be a more, better model. Zelton's game has been analyzed as an oligopoly, not just a duopoly. Um, because competition with more than two firms, I mean, right now we have two firms meeting. Um, what does that mean? I mean, uh, two, two coffee chains could compete individually in the street, right? With two, with two um, coffee shops, maybe. I mean, that's the model, but it's not generally maybe applicable. So we, we can, but then we have the problem of multi player equilibrium computation. And as I say, of course, we should try different base games. So that's, that's the goal here. As you see, um, a lot, I mean, not yet uh, with results, but I hope we can report on much more results in the future, and I look forward to your comments. Thank you. OK, so we have time for questions. Any questions? Yes, I'm not sure, though, for the other team, we have to come speak to the computer here. I think here is good. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the thanks for the talk. I uh, I had one question uh, regarding the connections to evolutionary dynamics. So in a in a finite population uh, one shot uh, Corno competition, it's known that the finite population ESS would actually be different from Nash equilibrium. So I was just wondering uh, what made you decide to train, or whether whether you're planning to train uh, your strategies also on, or your learning also on finite population ESS, and uh, whether that might not be the more natural, uh, natural, natural thing to to train them on if you're interested in predicting how real firms learn. Oh, oh no, that's I mean actually that's what I said. I, I'm pretty, I mean very much so. In fact, I mean. Um, so the, the, yes, the question is which equilibrium, and um, the tracing procedure has the feature that the equilibrium that you go to um, depends on the prior, um, and we have to check whether that's the same as the evolution of the dynamical system. Yeah, that's not what we, are, um, we have to try that. We want to compare actually the prior uh, computed equilibrium and what evolves in an, in an say, replicated dynamics. Um, and ESS, we have to first compute. It's not clear. So I would rather look at, say, like observing the dynamics and see whether the average stabilizes. A dynamic is normally not converging. It will have an, an attractor, but it will not have an, a single equilibrium. You would probably then look at um, the distribution, the average distribution in this, in this um, attractor as the, as the um, learning environment that we want to do. And then, yes, I, I agree with you. I mean, and it would be the more natural thing. Um, it's at the moment we. I don't have. A, I have algorithms for finding. I mean, uh, equilibrium from priors, but I don't have algorithms for evolutionary dynamics. We try and get to definitely. So let's look at it as a as a as a as a proxy. That's what I'm saying. This tracing procedure is a proxy. The tracing procedure has the advantage that you can try a lot of random starting points, and then take note of which equilibrium appears how often. Um, when Claudia Kesa ran her experiments, I mean, she actually observed, she ran the replicated dynamics and came up with these four strategies in the support in the, in the dynamics and then computed an equilibrium and that's what I did here. So, to repeat, I com agree completely with you, at the moment it's for computational simplicity and we'll investigate how good this proxy is or not. <laughs> I, guess, I guess another proxy would then also be to, uh, to replace the objective function by uh, from from payoffs to the difference of payoffs because that would give you the finite population ESS to uh, equilibrium in those in, 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 in those terms which would be different in a finite population even though that would be equivalent in continuous population. Yeah. 
So I have one question. Then you so and you would still so you would still accept a finite game like this one that we see right now, um, where when you you know in a evolutionary model it would be I mean a polymorphic. I mean you would have um, uh, population shares, right? I mean each of these strategies A B C D would have a population share, and each individual strategy A B C D would be evaluated in their in its fitness against how well it does according to this share. I mean, this is a very simple way to do it. You just multiply the population shares with, with these numbers, and then compute your fitness, and then um, increase or decrease it, depending on the dynamics that you choose, um, your fraction of the population. Um, so is that still a finite game for you, or an infinite one? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I guess, I, yeah, I guess oh, well, I, I guess then more generally my question would be, what's the right model to apply? And, I guess if you're actually having yeah, yeah. a number, if you're having a finite number of players whose traits evolve over time, then it would be a finite population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I see. I mean, the, 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 of course, in principle, our agent. You see, I mean, in the, the, the framework that I propose, these agents would pro agents would proliferate, but the learning environment would typically, and that's what I've observed. Even if you have lots of agents, the number of, uh, of and the support in the end is actually relatively small. Um, and that would be our learning environment. So it's not clear whether it stabilizes. I don't know. I mean, I mean the main problem is when you, you see this even this duopoly game has an enormous. I mean, it's in fact an infinite game. Even I mean, you have to discretize. Even if you discretize your your prices, say, eh? um, it's still a it's huge game. You cannot write down the extent of form or anything. I mean, uh, we try to capture the complexity of the strategies alone by trying to generate useful strategies. You know, with machine learning rather than designing them on our own. That's, that's the challenge. And that's, I think, is a general challenge in game theory that is quite realistic. I mean, you cannot write down the game. I mean, the, you need some way of representing reasonable strategies. That's what exactly one of the purposes of this, of this study. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, I'm, I'm sure Bernard will be happy to more <coughs> questions offline. Uh, any other questions? Yes. So uh, the previous speaker I heard very well. Say if I don't hear you very well um, at the moment. I, can you try? Yeah, to yeah, sorry. Say Mike. Yeah, I think, uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. I just had one question about the base game that you discussed at the beginning. I noticed that um, one of the equilibrium strategies that you highlighted had a dependence on like the period number. So it was kind of like a dynamic strategy over the course of the game. I was wondering yes. uh, what you would think about like an infinite horizon view of the same game. Do you think it would like uh, settle to a fixed uh, policy for each of the agents? I, yeah. Or do you I think, if, yeah. Yeah, I would assume that this middle part, I mean, this is the competitive strategy, but I would assume that this happens, I mean, that the end effect would vanish. Um, so this was the tournament was played over a constant number of rounds, and of course you would be stupid not to use it the fact that you had the last of the last round, because I mean why, why should you keep the same low price if you can make a higher profit there? But I think that's the distortion of what you want to investigate. I don't think we want learning agents to learn the end effect. First of all, because there is normally no end effect when you when you play such a game realistically, and secondly, we would need to count rather than looking at just the history of the last few few periods, which is what you tend to do in practice. You don't look at the at the whole history, but only the very recent thing, because you try to react and, and uh, some to see your customers that you fight against that, not against some long-term stuff. I see. So you don't think that that uh, reaction would continue out to infinity, and it would kind of become like maybe like a cyclic equilibrium type of concept, or you or you well, think I mean, that's, it, that's a quite good question. And the question is, how do you learn how to react against somebody who tries to steal customers if the whole thing evolves very peacefully and constantly? I mean, that's that's a good question. I, I think an interesting question is, well, if the um, see the point is, if you don't defend against these these stealing customers, you're vulnerable. And I would hope that there will be some because that is very well, that's very profitable if you have innocent strategies that just keep the constant prices. That's what I hope we find as well, that there are some invaders that we can fight against. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, again, um, 
yeah, I mean, it's all open. <laughs> it's boring. They all have uh, a certain cordial cooperative thing, and you have to deal with that because it's not a good way of playing the game unless you have people who defend against it. Right. So I think it's good to have some predators in there, too. But I agree with you, the end effect is not a good thing to, to have. That's why we think of introducing this termination probability. Okay, awesome. Thank you. At each round. Okay, th thanks very much, Ben Hart. Mm -hmm. uh, My pleasure. And I'll help uh, you know, connect uh, interested people <coughs> offline. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. I look forward to the videos of the other talk.